Hey guys, we're going to take you through the 1920s in this lecture. Normally we use essential questions. We're not using an essential question because I think that there's a lot of ideas in the 1920s that are hard to wrap under really one essential question that's easy to say. I will say this. Characteristically, we're going to say the word change a lot. The 1920s we can characterize as the decade of change. I see it almost like a 1960s kind of decade, where we really have kind of conservative and liberal forces that are fighting, not fighting like fist fighting, but fighting in the, the arena of politics and law and, and culture. A um, couple of ideas that we're going we're gonna to mention from World War I really quick, which of course isn't the 1920s, but does kind of bring us into the 1920s. Um, last lecture, we didn't say it, but we want to make sure we understand that, you know, stuff changes in America during war. Number one, um, in domestic policy, you get a lot more government intervention. Um, there were uh, regulation boards that were created to set prices and, and food quotas. Um, there was a Selective Service Act which drafted people. There were, people would call them maybe propaganda, but absolutely the government was creating, um, let's say, uh, measures of uh, convincing Americans that this was the right endeavor. Um, but nevertheless, two groups specifically experienced change because of the war, which is kind of a 1920s idea that we're going to explain. Um, one of them was women. And uh, we're going to say this for World War II as well, but basically the concept is that women go diesel during war. Um, because of the jobs, because of the men not being there, because of the radical shift in, in, in culture and what's going on around them and worlds are colliding and changing, um, women get to experience for the first time maybe what we can call independence in a, in a, in a sense. It's like the Tina Turner M&M idea. Once you get a little bit of an M&M, you, you don't want to go back. So that's a World War I question, women go diesel. But the 1920s idea is, is that they're not done, that they're not going to go back to the way it was. Some are, it's not like everybody changes, but there is a segment of the population, some uh, people call them flappers, um, young women in their 20s, kind of, I guess, today's radicals, maybe today they would have a mohawk or pink hair, have tattoos or nose rings or, 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 or something, but these were challenging the conventions of society. I'm not saying it's good, I'm not saying it's bad, I'm just saying it is. And that's an example of these flappers of kind of jazz women and smoking smokes and wearing short skirts and cutting their hair and living life differently. Um, is it, it's evidence of that change. African Americans are another group that we're going to find um, faced uh, tremendous change in the 1920s. During World War I, like women, um, there's enormous job opportunity in the North. Um, Maybe not the same jobs that women got in factories, but service-orientated jobs, some factory jobs. But it ain't Jim Crow. It ain't going to be that good either in terms of the racism that they're going to face. But um, in terms of the Ku Klux Klan and burning crosses and um, you know Jim Crow era laws and lynching and this sort of thing, it's going to be a little better in the North. Four million African Americans made the Great Migration to the North during World War I into the 19, early 1920s. Four million. Um, and when they got there, and this is the 1920s idea, it was almost like, holy hell, where's my megaphone? Finally, we have a chance to express ourselves. This Harlem Renaissance, which is from Harlem, but it's a renaissance for African American culture, whether it's in jazz or Langston Hughes with writing or Bessie Smith with, with uh, the blues or um, sculptors and painters and, um, and all types of expressionaries um, from the African American community that really, again, illustrate this change, this, this idea that we're, we're going from the old way to the new way. And, um, of course, African-American culture, now that they have the megaphone that they were so wrongfully um, not given or weren't allowed to, 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 to keep, it's a natural right, um, is, is, is theirs. I'm not saying that there's not racism. I'm not saying there's not racism today. I'm saying for the first time, we have the ability to kind of think of it like this way. If we're a quilt, African-Americans ain't had no needle. Now they have a needle to build themselves into the quilt that we call America good for us. 1920s, as I look at my watch. And this really doesn't give any of this justice, folks. I have to say that. Um, at the end of the day, we are summarizing, we are belting out Regent's answers. We really, we really want to get the full effect by being in class. So, come to class. Okay. Um, other 1920s ideas that we want, to, we, we want to get across. Thesis. Big idea. A thesis is an umbrella. It hangs over us. It, it is true for lots of pieces of American history and history in general. And one of them is when the hits the fan, when crisis occurs, someone's going to lose their rights. Well, we have a crisis in the 1920s. It's the same one that's going to come back in the 1950s. It's called the Red Scare. 
And this goes back to the Russian Revolution that we mentioned in World War I. That Bolshevik Revolution, that idea that we're communists that are going to take over the world. Maybe that's not what they're up to, but it's in the Communist Manifesto. This scares capitalism. It scares, maybe not all Americans, I'm not saying the poor might not be attracted to something like that. And I'm not saying that, you know, um, it's a good idea. I'm not saying any of that. So please, um, I would rather not hear from Rush Limbaugh or um, Keith Oberman. But the idea being is um, someone's going to lose their rights. And those are going to be basically people we suspect of being red communism. And again, the people that lose their rights, a lot of, they ain't going to be guilty. All right, they're just going to be happen to be in the wrong skin when this 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 fire occurs, um, and this fire, of course, is is the crisis of of whether it's the communist revolution or it's World War II later or it's 9/11. Someone's going to lose their rights. It's usually not someone like me, but this results in first an increase in nativism and uh, xenophobia, um, but we're also going to get specific laws that deal with immigration. Remember that immigration thesis. When times are good, um, generally economically, we're thinking cheap labor, come on in, come on in, come on in. But during times of xenophobia and nativism, um, there's this pushback, like the Chinese Exclusion Act. Now in the 1920s, we have the National Origins Act, which basically shuts the door on these countries that we believe are red-ish. So if you're from Germany, or you're from Russia, or you're from, um, I'm going to say a country that didn't exist probably, but if you're from Yugoslavia, uh, Yugoslavia or uh, Austria, or these countries where you look different, even Italy, um, southern Italy, Greece, um, if you look different, you smell different, you think different, we, we, we're going to label you different. And um, this example is shown through Sacco and Vanzetti. Sacco and Vanzetti were two Italian immigrants that happened to be kind of socialist anarchists, um, not not radically violent guys, but wrong place, wrong time. And they were suspected of being the murderers in this murder where they really didn't do it and they had good alibis. But because they were Italians, because they were seen as reddish, they were really railroaded and uh, they were executed. They were absolutely put to their deaths. And that's an example of Red Scare's civil rights thesis. It's also an example of nativism. Um, the Palmer Raids, which occurred when the Attorney General had a freaking coronary because something occurred to his house. It's a long story, but warrantless searches sound familiar. Um, during times of crisis, excuse me, rights become limited. Other 1920s ideas we want to get across really quick, guys. Prohibition. Remember, we have two amendments. If you think of the two drinking ages in American history, you know two amendments. 18, of course, being no booze. 21, the end of prohibition. You need to know for the exam, this is a miserable failure. Um, the idea, I guess, being that you can't convince people to give things up that they love um, by law. And uh, actually, you have more drinking and more violence when the stuff is illegal than when it's legal. When it seems to, when it goes underground, I guess, maybe there's more um, unattractive forces associated with, with, with sale of, of, of the uh, item in question. So you get Al Capone rather than the bartender down the street. Um, so that's a miserable failure. We're going to get rid of that eventually. Um, women, of course, are now a force to be reckoned with with the 19th Amendment. I'm thinking of other 1920s things, guys. Ooh, I got one. Um, one of the big ideas of, of old versus new that they use on the test is the Scopes Monkey Trial. The Scopes Monkey Trial occurred in Tennessee when John Scopes, a science teacher, um, refused to teach creationism to his students, which I guess was part of Tennessee law, and he decided he was a scientist, he had to teach evolution. So he was arrested, and this trial between um, Scopes, who was represented, I believe, by Charles Darrow, I'm going to get that wrong too, and Williams Jennings Bryant, <laughs> working on my names, guys, wow, um, that represented, I believe, um, if you give me a second here, um, the state of Tennessee. The Scopes trial becomes the illustration of old versus new, of kind of religion and Bible and fundamentalism and conservatism, and uh, maybe the the woman who's more modest in her appearance and conservative in that home as opposed to the flapper and the evolution and the change and science and the jazz and the um, and the booze and the, the partying and the you know, F. Scott Fitzgerald and the great Gatsby and all this other stuff that's going on. So again, very much like the kind of the 1960s, a, a decade of change. 
So we're going to talk soon about how the excesses of the 1920s, because economically it's a strong period for America, not for all Americans. I'm not saying African Americans or immigrants or other uh, people that didn't ride on the, the dream of success um, so early in American history aren't going to have problems. But I'm up with time. We'll see you later. Alligator questions? We're not.